Scott Galloway gilt als Marketingvisionär. Als international gefragter Speaker steht er regelmäßig auf großen Bühnen. Er ist Professor an der New York University und unterrichtet dort Brand Strategy und Digital Marketing. Mit seinem Research-Unternehmen L2 hat er den Digital IQ Index geschaffen. Dieser bewertet die digitale Performance und Kompetenz von Marken weltweit. In seinem vielbeachteten Buch The Four analysiert Scott Galloway die Erfolgsstrategien der vier US-Giganten Amazon, Google, Facebook und Apple. Seine Thesen sorgen regelmäßig für Aufsehen und Diskussionsstoff in der Marketingwelt. Ah, hello Scott, can you hear us? How are you? Ah, very good, very good, thank you. <laughs> So, we are live now and we saw you pass by about 200 times now. <laughs> I was pacing. I'm, a, I'm an old man. I forget where I am and I start walking around. <laughs> and it's pretty early in New York. So, thanks very much for being here. It's a great honor. It's a great pleasure. Despite the fact that we can only meet on, in a virtual sense, it's great that you took the time to uh, be uh, with us. And... I thought, um, well, you have massively criticized Google, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon. Do you know about some secret projects that they're working on to influence the weather? Maybe that's their revenge against you. Do you know something about that? We could use it here. It's, uh, I don't know, has anybody heard from spring? It is still snowing here. <laughs> So, great that you're here. Scott, you're a, a brilliant observer and an analyst of the global digital business world. You were named one of the world's 50 best um, high school and, and or business school professors. You were awarded to be uh, one of the top leaders of tomorrow by the World Economic Forum. But I also have to say, I think you are the worst Adele impersonator in the whole world. Maybe we can Not have a look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Not so. <laughs> so we have a short video here. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> so I. I I, I think this. every I think every father's mission in life is to embarrass his children. So I think I've accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> you got high score. <laughs> so when I saw this performance live at DLD in 2016 at the DLD conference in, in Munich, I thought, what the hell? Why is, is this guy doing this? Uh, because there was no real link between your presentation, which was brilliant, by the way. And okay. this performance, and I only found out later that this performance, and of course the smart things that you said, made you the most viewed DLD uh, presenter ever. So I must say you're not only a really, really bad Adele impersonator, you're also a very smart marketing guy. So <laughs> congratulations for that. Yeah. But we do not want to talk about men in women's clothes standing on stage and performing today. We have some other topics, and uh, you gained a lot of attention recently with your brilliant book, The Four. I will hold it in the camera to push your sales a bit. That's the book I can highly recommend to everybody. It's, it's just brilliant. Die geheime DNA von Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. It's a must read. And um, you came in this book, you came to the conclusion that uh, the four have become so powerful and so big that we need to break them up. So I would like to discuss about that with you. And, uh, but I would also like to touch some other topics. You have a very strong position on the future of the marketing and the advertising world. And as all the people in the room today are marketeers, I think it will be very interesting for them to hear your point of view on that. And finally, you are famous for your predictions on what will happen in the digital uh, business. And you're famous for this because your predictions are always very concrete. Uh, which is pretty rare in our business. And um, so I would like to touch some predictions for 2000, 2018 and uh, hear your point of view on that. But let's start with the four, or as you say, the four horsemen. I'm not so sure if you all are familiar with the Bible. Um, the four, we have to change something? No, okay. The four horsemen in German are the apocalyptischen Reiter, and they are described in the last book of the New Testament. 
They ride on white, red, black, and pale horses, and they symbolize pestilence, war, famine, and death. Now it's up to you to decide whether, which one of the four stands for what, but you could also turn it the opposite way around. You can say the four are the biggest gathering of IQ and financial power in history. With they have the power to solve problems in, in the world. They offer great services free of charge to their consumers. They say they do no evil. They connect the world. They're young, they're bright, they're nice and cool. So Scott, tell us, why do you think are these four so dangerous, dangerous that we should break them up? So uh, thank, that's a thoughtful question, and thank you, and thanks to everyone for, for, for uh, hosting me. So I, don't, I think on the whole, these four firms are good for the world. Um, and personally, I'm very fond of the companies. I love their products. Amazon is the number one recruiter for students out of my class. I personally have benefited enormously economically because I own their stocks. They have been clients of mine. But I think a, a natural part of the economic cycle is that a firm gathers a lot of power and a lot of influence, and then it uses that influence to grow unfettered and avoid regulation, and that at some point it starts abusing its position and its monopoly power, and it becomes bad for the um, economic well-being of the world, and in some cases can actually undermine our democracy, as we're seeing with Facebook being weaponized by foreign actors. So I want to be clear. I don't, I don't think these firms should go away. I don't think they're evil. I think a natural part of the economic cycle is to step in and regulate and perhaps even break up these firms when we get to the point where they've amassed so much power that small firms are having trouble getting out of the crib and big firms are being euthanized early and we have job destruction that we probably shouldn't have. So in the case of Google, 92% market share of a sector surged that by dollar volume is bigger than the entire advertising market of Germany. So imagine a media company or one agency controlled 92% of all radio, billboards, television advertising, all marketing in Germany, one company had a 92% share. You probably say, well, that's a bad thing. And that might lead to abuse. That might lead to it being hard for small agencies to start. It might result in good medium-sized agencies going out of business. It might result in advertisers having to pay higher rents or higher rates because there's only one player. That's where we are with Google. With Facebook, four of the five top apps globally are owned by Facebook, and they have all squared their guns directly on the fifth snap. So Facebook has technology that goes out and monitors every app in the world. And when an app is getting traction, it adopts those features into its own apps. And if they can't catch up to that app, they go out and acquire it. So we're at a point now where we have to collectively make a decision. Are we comfortable with four companies having more economic power and influence than almost any nation or any entity? Or do we believe that breaking them up might result in more competition, more job growth, lower rents on their customers, a broader tax base. I believe that we want to keep the good times going. They're not evil. I don't think Ma Bell was evil when we broke them up. I don't think the railroads were evil when we broke them up. You have this fantastic ecosystem of medium-sized companies in Germany. Those medium-sized companies, is it called Mittelstadt? I don't, I forget the name. Mittelstand. In, yes. in America, those companies are under attack because we have four companies that are so dominant that it's very hard for any company to compete against, against them. So to summarize, I don't think they're evil. I think they're net positive for the world. But I think it, the government and citizenship has a role to ensure that we keep economic growth vibrant, that, that the economic spoils can be shared by more than a small group of people. Keep in mind, Facebook is worth more than Volkswagen, P&G, Unilever, Boeing, and Airbus, and it employs 24,000 people. So if the most successful companies in the world employ very few people, you know, it's good to own real estate in Palo Alto. It's great to be a Facebook shareholder, but is it good for society? The, the key to a healthy, robust society 
is the economic well-being of a middle class. Mm -hmm. That and maybe the percentage of women who go on to college. I think those two metrics, show me those two metrics and I'll show you how healthy a society is. And when I would argue that the rise of big tech is directly correlated to the stagnation of middle class wages. In sum, they're not evil, they're doing their job. But our job is to ensure that we have in place economic policies that ensure the growth of the middle class. And simply put, we're at a point in the economic cycle where it's time to break these guys up. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's really necessary to break them up or would it be enough to just regulate them? Which is a so tendency we have in Europe right now. There's a lot of things you could do. There's taxation, there's regulation. Uh, I personally believe that regulation tends to be somewhat ham-handed and expensive and creates permanent government jobs. And typically the company is smarter than the regulators. I personally feel that the smartest thing to do would be to break these guys up. So for example, if you took Facebook and broke it into Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp and Messenger, I believe one of those companies in an effort to gain more advertisers would build into its feature set immense security so that it could never be weaponized by political firms or never be weaponized by foreign actors. And I believe advertisers would like that. But right now, advertisers don't have a choice. I believe these firms would have to hire more people. I believe they would have to invest more in R&D. I believe they would have to acquire more companies. So for me, the, the full body contact of competition is a wonderful thing. And I think that this would be a more efficient way of building economic value. So when Ma Bell was broken up into several small telcos here in the US, we found that there was a lot of innovation in their R&D laboratory, Bell Labs, cell phones, data, fiber optics, that hadn't been given a chance to see the light of day because they didn't want to threaten their monopoly business. Mm -hmm. the, the, the scary thing here is we don't know what we're missing. We don't know what technologies and companies or small companies might emerge if they aren't immediately crushed by one company that controls the entire ecosystem for that sector. So what they're doing in Britain, they're talking about making Twitter and Facebook um, have the same legal liability as media companies. The GDRP, data and privacy out of Europe, what France is doing, talking about uh, creating a taxation system that's based on top line revenues instead of profitability, which we're learning is a, a very squishy term in the eyes of big tech. According, I mean, keep in mind, Amazon is about to become the most valuable company in the world. And by accounting standards, it made no profits last year. And paid no taxes. So imagine that, the most valuable company in the world, or what will soon be the most valuable company in the world, it's number, I believe it's number two right now, paid no taxes. Yeah. yeah. So our society just can't function when our, the most successful companies in the world don't pay taxes. We can't pay for our, we can't pay for NATO, we can't pay for our roads. So I, I think there's a lot of things we can do. And quite frankly, Europe is taking the lead on this. I personally, my weapon of choice is breaking them up Because I think 11 or 12 companies duking it out and fighting, hiring, innovation, M&A, job, job, more jobs, more tax base, I think that's a better solution long term than regulation or taxation. But I, I'm not an, I, I want to be clear, I'm not an expert. That's just what I think needs to happen. But it's clear something needs to happen. Yeah. If you look at it from the perspective of the advertising industry, there we have Facebook and Google. They rely on advertising revenues. We got Amazon, who will be one of the major players in the advertising business um, soon. And um, if we um, and um, the the point is, from a media planner's perspective, sometimes it feels if you push all the budgets in uh, towards Facebook or Google, it feels like paying your taxes because. There's just no choice. You, you have to do this. So in case of a breakup, Google still would have 90% of the search market. So would there anything change for the advertising industry? I think so, because if Google was broken up into Google, YouTube, and there was Facebook, Messenger, WhatsApp, and Instagram, advertisers and media companies would have six options as opposed to two. So right now it's sort of a love it or leave it. Two companies own 60, two thirds of all digital marketing globally. And I think that's bad. So if, I mean, if you think about advertisers, you're right, they have no choice. It's one or the other. 
And, and a lot of the rents that Facebook and Google are extracting from great companies, the res, it results in higher costs of digital marketing and advertising. And these traditionally, these companies have traditionally been very good employers. So what we have is these companies that are basically sucking revenue out of traditional media companies. And quite frankly, they're much more efficient. And so we're seeing job destruction. So for example, Google and Facebook will grow their revenues in 2018. They'll grow their revenues $24 billion. They need to hire another 23,000 people to service that revenue. Those are 23,000 high paying information age jobs. Most of them will be in America. Some will be in Europe, a few around the rest of the world. That's a good thing, 23,000 new jobs. Now, advertising and media, as many people in your audience will, can confirm, is a zero growth business globally. It's not growing. So it's a zero sum game, meaning if Facebook and Google take 23 billion out of the ecosystem, we're gonna lose 23 billion from somewhere else. Traditional media agencies or media firms, whether it's ProSieben, Publicis, WPP, Omnicom, they need 250,000 people to service the $23 billion in revenue that they will lose to Facebook and Google. What this means is you could take two and you could fill, is it, what's this big stadium in Hamburg? It's called the Volks something. What's the, where the football team plays in Hamburg? What's, what's the name of the stadium? stadium? You could take that stadium and fill it with copywriters, agency planners, media executives, creative directors, you could fill it up two and a half times every January 1 and say, courtesy of Facebook and Google, you are now out of work. So the job destruction here is unparalleled. A lot of our friends in the agency world are going to decide to spend more time with their families over the next few years because there's an immense sucking sound out of traditional media and agencies to Facebook and Google. Now, if they were five or six firms instead of two, I believe they would be forced to have lower rents, meaning advertisers would have more profits, more capital for hiring, and they would be forced to hire more people to be more competitive. So I'm not saying put them out of business because they job destroy jobs. We need job destroyers. Manufacturers put farmers out of business. Services companies put manufacturers out of business. But we're seeing big tech put so many people out of business so fast that the question becomes, has it reached a point where we should slow it down and break them up such that the job destruction isn't as fast as it is right now? Yeah. You already talked about the advertising business and, uh, and the challenges the business faces. I have uh, found three quotes. You already mentioned one. Creative heads and agencies might decide to spend more time with their families. This is what I have written down here. I have two other ones. Uh, one is uh, ad-supported media is not going away. It's just going to be a beep place to work and invest. And the beep is because it was a video. And uh, I guess there was something behind the beep. And the third one is advertising is becoming a tax only poor people pay. Um, so if I look at our daily routines, I have, to be honest, the opposite impression. The more complex the marketing world gets, the less time we have to spend with our families. So why do you think that the branding and advertising business will face hard times? Maybe it's only the business model that the advertising industry is right in, but the services are still highly requested. So I, I believe that if you were to look at media generally and say what portions of media are growing and what portions of media are in structural decline, because a lot of my students come to me and say, where should I go to work? I believe ad-supported media is in structural decline. And that, so traffic and ad-supported media in decline, what I'll call an audience and subscription-based media where pe the people are willing to pay for is accelerating. So you want to be working for, for Netflix or even Prime Video not for ProSieben or for um, uh, or for even a firm like um, uh, uh, Actual Springer. Ad-supported media is in structural decline. And the reason why is that with technology, we can now avoid advertising. We can put on blockers. Think about your own media viewing. I bet you are watching more Amazon Prime Video and more Netflix and less advertising-supported media. I watch not. my... <laughs> my favorite 
<laughs> no, you're okay. right. I, I admit. My, <laughs> my favorite show is Modern Family. It's a wonderful show here in, in the U.S. Uh, I assume you have it in, in Germany. And I come home and I can download it for free from the network that hosts it. Or I can pay $2.99 and download it off of Apple uh, television. I choose the latter because when I download it from Apple television, I watch 21 minutes of uninterrupted content. If I download it from the network for free, I get nine minutes of advertising telling me I want a South Korean car, a light beer, or that I have restless leg syndrome, or that I'm bipolar. The ads are, the ads are so irrelevant, so bad, so non-targeted, that I am, as a, a, a relatively, with someone with some disposable income, I am opting out of advertising. And slowly but surely, the people who have to endure the most advertising are the people who have, don't have the technical skills or don't have the money and need ad-supported media. So in sum, where do you invest your money? Where do you invest your human capital? You want to go to media that has an audience and is so strong that people are willing to pay for it. If it's ad supported, you're competing with platforms that can reach 2 billion people in a targeted way, Facebook or Google. So it is very difficult to be an ad supported media right now. Mm -hmm. So what's your recommendation? How should uh, marketing organizations or media creative agencies uh, transform in order to be fit for the future? Or to say it in other words, how can we avoid to become a beep place to work and invest? So I, I, there's still, obviously, there's never been a need for uh, more of a need for Sherpas or mentors to help businesses figure this out. What you have at a lot of agencies typically is you have very creative, innovative people. And I think they're going to have to switch that creativity and innovation from focusing on a 30-second spot and media to what is it about the, the product? What is it about the purchase process? What is it about the communities? What is it about packaging? What is it about design? Things that are more focused on how you purchase the product, things that are more focused on the product itself, things that create more influence online. You're going to see a reallocation of capital out of media and out of advertising into loosely what is called innovation. And that is everything from how people discover the product with influencers to the product features itself, to how people buy it, how it's supported, how they get customer service. So what you have in agencies is you have a group of exceptionally creative thinkers posing as an ad agency. I mean, show me someone who knows how to help a client figure out a media strategy and a commercial that breaks through. And I'll show you someone who's creative and what I'll call an innovative thinker. Those people have never been in more demand. It's just that trying to shuffle that human capital through a 30-second ad buy It's a, if you're a great athlete, it doesn't mean you should be on top of a horse pulling a buggy. It means you have to find another sport. But what you have in these firms are great athletes. To be blunt, if you're my age, if you're 50, you ride it out, you do your best. If you're under the age, you have to figure out these platforms. You have to become more data rich. You have to start thinking about design, packaging, innovation, product development. To a certain extent, It's revenge of the nerds. It's people who really understand data, analytics, and are willing to think about new ways to deliver the product. So I, I, I think that the world's never been better for remarkably innovative and creative people. They just had a bust. We're just going to have to bust out of this existing business model. There's going to be a lot of pain in the short term, though. There's just no getting around it. I, I would like to, to add uh, to this. Um, We think the interface between media, creative services, and technology, this is where the really interesting stuff happens today. So if you can combine these things and you have brilliant minds in all these disciplines working closely together, this is what still works and what will work in the, in, in the future. So my last topic will be predictions. Um, you're well known for your very concrete predictions. For example, you have predicted last year that Amazon will buy Whole Foods. And it happened, I think, one week after your prediction. So, uh, wow. Um, however, I checked your score for last year, uh, and I think the hit rate could be improved. You made 10 predictions for 2017. Three were right, three were wrong. 
and four were so and so. Yeah. So it reminded me somewhat of the old saying in advertising that 50% of your investment is wasted money. You just don't know which 50%. And yeah. if we would tell this to clients, they would kill us. But you get away with that. So congratulations yeah. for that. <laughs> but have a, let's have a look at some predictions for 2018. And maybe you can give some background on why you think they will come true. One I chose is the ad tech market surrenders to Facebook and Google. Large ad agency networks lose 20 to 50% of their value. Digital marketing or content darlings like Refinery29, AppNexus, BuzzFeed become distressed assets because of the Facebook-Google duopoly. That's a black future. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty ugly, but I think I think the prediction around the big ad agency conglomerates declining 20 to 50 percent, I think that's already happened. If you look at uh, what's happened in the digital marketing ecosystem, Facebook and Google are now responsible for 104 percent of the growth in digital marketing. So digital marketing is growing. That's the good news. The bad news is 104 percent of the growth is going to two players, which means if you're not Facebook or Google and you're in digital marketing. You might as well be the yellow pages in the magazine industry and that your business is in structural decline. Mm -hmm. So I think all these darlings of yesteryear, all these small digital media properties are going to start really, really suffering. And I think we're seeing this across the ecosystem. But I, I stand by most of those predictions. I think I think so far most of those predictions are playing out. Mm -hmm. Second prediction is large consumer packaged good firms merge or forward integrate and acquire retail, which I think is really interesting, as they realize a voice controlled world is really, really bad for them. Do you think that the acquisition of retail would help CPG companies? I do. I think what you're seeing is what I'll call the death of the advertising industrial complex. And for the last 40 years, we've been in sort of what I call the era of brand. Post-World War II to the introduction of Google, the algorithm for creating value, shareholder value, was to take an average product and create fantastic and tangible associations, what we refer to as a brand. So make a, make a mediocre shoe feel like Mike, you're like Michael Jordan in a winner. Take a mediocre beer and it makes you feel more American or if we talk about puppies. Take a mediocre soft drink and it makes you feel more youthful or more European. And we could take a 30 cent product and turn it into something worth a dollar or three dollars. The era of brand, the sun has passed midday on that era. And it's now more of an innovation era that's more about data and helping get people get, get things done incredibly, um, incredibly fast. Traditional CPG companies get irrational margins. So Nike, Rolex, Procter & Gamble, I work with all of them, Samsung, they all want to talk about innovation. They all want to talk about Facebook. And I've told them all, they all need to do the same thing over the next 10 years, and it's the number one priority. And that is Nike has to go from 10%, Samsung has to go from 2%, Rolex has to go from 5%, P&G has to go from 1% of their sales done direct to consumer, and they have to take it to 30 and 50. There's three ways to build a brand, if you will. There's pre-purchase advertising, there's purchase what happens to you in the point of distribution of the store, and then there's post-purchase. This first portion, pre-purchase, is losing its effectiveness. The valerium steel, the sword of pre-purchase advertising, is getting duller and duller and duller. However, the depth of stores has been greatly exaggerated. The most value-creating decision in business over the last 30 years was Apple's irrational, crazy decision to take $6 billion out of advertising and reallocate it into this dying medium called stores. And now they have 550 temples to the brand that when you go in to buy an Apple product, you want to have you want to have a relationship with this brand. You want to maintain some sort of connection to it. You come out inspired by Apple. When I go in to buy a, a Samsung product in a Vodafone or a T-Mobile store, I walk out and think, I want to go have a relationship with Apple now. So <laughs> the, the ability to maintain these irrational margins comes down to brand building. And brand building is moving to the point of purchase of the store. So if Nike or Procter & Gamble want to maintain their margins, they need to get more heavily into controlling their distribution. There's an opportunity here because the general assumption in the marketplace 
is that all of retail is going out of business at the hands of Amazon. And that's just not true. So I don't know who it is, but you're going to see in the next 12 to 36 months, you're going to see Carrefour acquired. Because grocery is the largest market in the world, and the only way you can maintain a consistent relationship with someone is through their stomach, their refrigerator, and through grocery. Mm -hmm. And Carrefour is at historically low valuation right now, so I could see a CPG company or a tech company that wants to own grocery and your refrigerator and your stomach swooping in and buying Carrefour. Sounds You're like gonna a see nice these meal for Amazon, no? Pardon? Sounds like a nice meal for Amazon. Could be. Uh, yeah. That you know. That's. I think that's one of the more likely acquisitions for Amazon. But it could be someone else. It could be one. It could be Unilever. I think that would be an interesting acquisition for them. In sum, I think these companies need to forward integrate into retail mm -hmm. advertising. So ad agencies, ad conglomerates are going to decline in value. You're actually going to see an increase in value of traditional retailers because they have been beaten up so badly. And 88% of retail is still done through bricks and mortar. Last prediction, and to be honest, it's not your prediction, it's my prediction. Scott Galloway is running for president of the United States in 2020 after having broken up the four and generating one million new millionaires instead of one trillionaire named Jeff Bezos. How likely is that? That's a lot for a bumper sticker, but I have, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I have, I have too many skeletons in the closet. And my observation af after having the opportunity to get to know some very powerful people is that the algorithm for happiness is to have a loving family, have economic security and anonymity with a, an emphasis on anonymity. So uh, I have all of those things. I have absolutely no desire to run for uh, public office. And we, I've entered into a situation in the U.S. where our public leaders no longer have the attributes of maturity and thoughtfulness like your German leader. So we need less, I would argue, we need less uh, fame. We need less fame and more competence along the line of some of uh, the European leaders. So that's, you know, anyways, I'm, I'm ranting, but that is a prediction as I'm 100% I'm convinced will not happen, but I appreciate the thought. Maybe you can at least think about vice president or something like that. <laughs> no, so, I want to be U.S. ambassador to Germany. I'm ready. My wife was born. <laughs> You're welcome. My wife was born <laughs> and just you know, I throw the best parties. So you're all invited. Once I'm appointed, we're, we're every every Friday night at my house. The best beer and sausage an American can find. That's great. The American Embassy is right across the corner here from our agency. Perfect. We will be there. <laughs> so, so We're I think in. We're in. <laughs> that's the perfect moment to open up the discussion to the audience because uh, everybody here in the room, you have the, the rare um, opportunity to talk to Scott Galloway directly. Tomorrow you will have to share him with 4,000 people at the OMR stage. W will you be there anyway? <laughs> uh, is the, the airport already open again? Oh, no, it's, it's, it's now virtually impossible for me to get there. I'm going to be coming. It's going to feel like I'm on trial in the future. I'm going to be on that giant screen live from New York. Okay, that makes it even more important. I, it worked brilliantly here. So um, I would ask the audience now, if you have questions for Scott Galloway, I will repeat them because we have only this small microphone on, on the laptop computer here. And let's check if that works. Any questions to ich hab, Scott ich Galloway? Ich habe die neueste Errungenschaft der Mikros, einen Würfel, den ich werfe und der dann hoffentlich auch funktioniert. Right. The, oh, it functions. It's great. <laughs> And, so we should make okay. a check. Scott, can you hear? Can you hear us? Like this? I can. Thank you. Okay. First Perfect. of all, thanks for this it. very inspiring p speech. Um, I, uh, you mentioned a few analogies when you spoke about the split-up process of the Big Four. Um, you spoke about the railways and... Um, a thing that came to my mind was the um, the story of the split up of Standard Oil, the the the, um, uh, the Rockefeller story that was split up in Texaco and Standard and everything. My question to you is, how would a process like this actually look like? I mean, we are talking about global companies. Who would be in the position to start a split up process, and how would this look like in your uh, when, when you do a prognosis? Um, Who would, who would be capable to do that, and how would this function? 
So the, the mechanics of it, at least in the U.S., is the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission would file suit against against one of these companies and say that they've engaged in anti-competitive behavior and rule that they need to be broken up. It's happened before. It can happen again. And you'd have a series of economists and consultants decide how to break them up. And even the threat of breakup can be, can be useful. So in 1999, the U.S. Department of Justice moved in and filed suit against Microsoft and said that they were using their bundling power and influence to put innovative companies out of business. And the, the, the Department of Justice was disturbed that, I don't know if anyone remembers, Netscape had basically been put out of business by Microsoft in about 24 months. And the DOJ said to Microsoft, we're going to break you up because we're worried that you're putting great, small, innovative companies out of business prematurely. Now, if the DOJ had not moved in on Microsoft in 99, and ultimately that was overturned, but Microsoft, I think, was sufficiently scared enough that they decided to be more careful about anti-competitive behavior. And the question now is, the object of every innovator's affection is Google, $750 billion market cap, 75,000 employees. I would argue if the DOJ had not moved in on Microsoft in 1999, we would be talking about Bing and Google would not exist. Microsoft would have performed infanticide on Google and it never would have gotten out of the crib. So Department of Justice, the EU Com uh, Commission on Competitiveness, I think them moving in on companies and either warning them or starting to break them up, I think it keeps the good times going. So you asked about the mechanics. I think it's the DOJ or the FTC. Now, realistically, it's not going to happen in the U.S. in this administration. We have a president that sees uh, these companies as, now I don't want to say his allies, but when they're weaponized, they're usually weaponized to his advantage. And I don't believe Washington, D.C. has the will or the collective IQ to take on big tech right now. Amazon has 77 full-time lobbyists in Washington preventing this. They own one of the most powerful newspapers, the Washington Post. So I don't think it's going to happen here. Where you could see regulation, and this is my challenge to Europe, you could see it come out of Europe because it, in America, we gain a lot from these companies. We're net gainers. They hire a lot of people. They pay some taxes. A lot of Americans make a lot of money from these companies. In Europe, you register all of the downside of big tech, the weaponization of the platforms to influence elections, the job destruction, the erosion of your tax base, anti-competitive behavior. But you register a fraction of the upside. How many university buildings or hospital wings in Germany are named after Facebook or Google billionaires? I bet it's this many. So but I think they don't Europe even has have internet connections there. <laughs> <laughs> I think the war against big tech, the pushback, the arming of the rebel force is up to Europe. Just as we had D Day and came in and assisted you in 1942, we need to come in and assist us. The war against big tech breaks out in Europe. We need you. Don't let us down. <laughs> I, I just thought the phrase D-Day becomes a completely new meaning now. <laughs> it's digital day now, and the opposite way around. <laughs> okay. That's right. Do we have further questions? Over there. Derf direkt, wenn du das machen magst. He will throw the microphone, be careful. Uh, Scott, just looking at the current situation, uh, Facebook maneuvered itself into, or has been maneuvered into, and the media uh, really getting on that bandwagon. Uh, you already pointed out, uh, quite frankly, that already now advertisers don't really have a choice. It, they're stuck between Google and Facebook. Now the choice might have gotten harder or worse. What do you think are the consequences, long term or even mid term, uh, on that Cambridge Analytica and, and Facebook thing going on? So unfortunately, I don't think I don't think a lot's going to happen. Um, I think that the response by Mark Zuckerberg from a from a shareholder standpoint was very strong. He apologized. It sounded as if they're planning to do things, but when you really think about it, they're not really planning to do anything. They didn't outline any any um, action that would in any way damage their revenues. So the weaponization of Facebook is only going to get worse. Uh, so I don't see I don't see um, a lot changing. Um, so, for example, 
consumers are outraged by what happened and how do they express their outrage? They go on Facebook or Instagram. Um, I, so let's do a quick poll and I won't be able to see you, but how many of you after the weaponization of Facebook and the subterfuge of democracy of these platforms, how many of you have deinstalled Facebook or uh, Instagram? Who has deinstalled Facebook or Instagram? We got one lady, two, it's two out of 150. Okay, and I would say to those two, I don't believe you. <laughs> okay, it's one. <laughs> So I, I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't see a whole lot of change. I, I, I think until I think it's going to get worse before it gets better because investors are doing well. Advertisers have no choice. Washington doesn't have the political will and consumers talk a big game. But at the end of the day, they want that little black dress for $9.99 or they want their Nespresso pods delivered within 48 hours for free. And these companies do a great job. They do. Yeah. I think we've already run out of time. I get some nervous signs here. <laughs> this is where, where I would like to end the panel. Scott, thanks a lot for your time and your insights. That was just brilliant. And it was the perfect start for the afternoon now um, because we have some more speakers coming up to the panel. And I would be extremely happy to welcome you here maybe next year for pilot at OMR in person. It would be great to meet you. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.